Good evening, everybody, and welcome to a special online meeting discussing where next for skill funding. My name is Laura Flynn and I'm an organiser for NEHT and we are delighted to bring together this evening groups of coalition partners involved in skill funding campaigns and also interested organisations to provide uh, what I hope will be an interesting and interactive discussion for you this evening. Um, we have structured the agenda this evening into three sections. Um, we will be posting an agenda into the chat function so you can see um, how we are going to be progressing this evening. But we will take a panel of people together and at the end of that panel, you'll be able to pose questions to people. Uh, you can pose questions through the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and you are able to upvote if you would like a particular question asked rather than asking the same question again. Um, please do use the chat, chat room. Uh, please do interact with each other. Please do um, let us know where you're listening from. And please let us uh, know um, what you, uh, what any questions you want to ask. Um, and we are delighted to welcome over 700 people registered for the event this evening. We are here, we're here with parents, with governors, with school staff, um, with union representatives, and also MPs and local councillors and journalists from various regional and national newspapers. So please do contribute in the chat button, in the chat function, but also just be aware that it's a public forum and this is a public meeting. So thank you very much for that. Uh, please do, do tweet around the event. The uh, hashtag is school funding were next. And we're delighted to have uh, contributions on Twitter. And as I said, ask your questions in the Q&A box, not in the chat room. And we will start uh, the meeting, first of all, by discussing the detail of school funding. We'll be hearing from Meg Hillier, MP, who is chair of the Public Accounts Committee, Luke Sibietta, who is from the Institute of Fiscal Studies, Andrew Baisley from NEU, and Julie Cordiner from School Financial Success. So if you do have any questions for any of those particular speakers, if you are able to put the name alongside the question, so example, question for somebody, and then your question, that will help us address it to the right person. Uh, we will then be moving on to be talking about the experience of school funding. And we're delighted this evening to be joined by school leaders from a range of different settings. We'll be hearing from Emily Prophet. She is a head teacher in Staffordshire and she's representing the F40 group. We have James Kewin, who is from the Sixth Form Colleges Association. Tara Entwistle, uh, who is a maintained nursery school leader from Lancashire. And Graeme Galt, who is a principal from Northern Ireland and he is a principal of a school in County Armagh. Um, just at this point, we were hoping to hear from Chris Britton, who is a head teacher in Wales and a special school leader, but unfortunately he's been called away to deal with a COVID issue. So apologies, we won't be able to have the Wales and special school perspective. After that, we will move on to be talking about the future of school funding and the campaign for school funding. We'll be hearing from Jeff, Jeff Barton from ASCL, Steve Edmonds from the National Governance Association, Jules White from the Worthless Campaign, Alison Alley from the Save Our Schools campaign and Paul Whiteman from NEHT. So if you do have any questions, please do look at the agenda in the chat box and please do try and uh, let us know which speaker you would like to address your question to. But we want to make it as interactive as possible. So please do use the uh, voting buttons. We're also gonna be having some polls during the evening, which I will be um, setting, uh, setting live at the appropriate point. Uh, so please do have your say on those um, and please do interact with each other on the chat button. But first of all, I am um, going to move on to our speakers and I'm delighted to welcome our first speaker, Meg Hillier MP. Meg is chair of the Public Accounts Committee and we are very grateful to you for giving up your time this evening to join us to talk about this issue. So thank you very much, Meg, over to you. Well, thank you. And it's a pleasure to talk to people who are really at the front line at such a particularly important time, uh, supporting our young people to get back into to learning. So it's always a pleasure to be with you. My name, uh, as you've heard, is Meg Hillier. Uh, I'm a member of parliament in East London, but for today's purposes, my main role for being reason for being here is that I chair parliament's public spending watchdog, the Public Accounts Committee. 
So what we do week in, week out, twice a week uh, when Parliament's sitting, is we look at how government spends taxpayers' money. So we crawl over the detail with uh, significant support from the National Audit Office, which is the body that has full and open access to every public body. Not only do they audit the accounts, but they can also do value for money studies about how uh, every bit of the public sector spends public money, taxpayers' money. So what I want to do, I'm not going to bombard you with too many figures, and it's it's really a canter through. So if you're interested, I'd point you to our website. If you can't find something, then do contact me directly, and I'll point you in the right direction. Um, but we've done a number of reports about the sustainability of school funding uh, and capital funding as well, as well as specific issues around special educational needs. So today I'm just going to canter through really the headlines on school funding overall. And I say the headlines because very often that's what happens in politics and parliament. We talk about the headlines. So your, one of my missions is to challenge any government minister or indeed anyone, but particularly government ministers who rattle off a statistic in the House of Commons about how much extra money is going into schools, um, but they don't put it in context. So I'm hoping to put that in a bit of context for you. I think on the front line, you probably know this, but just to be really clear. So one of the things the government currently says is, oh, well, we're putting more money into schools than, than they have had for uh, a decade or for, for a long time. And we go, yes, but that's not putting it back to the level that it was in 2010. We've seen an 8% per pupil per head decrease in funding over the decade. Um, and that's what you're battling against when you're trying to set your budgets. And of course, uh, those of you who are school leaders will know that the lion's share of funding in schools is staffing, mostly teachers. Um, but there are extra costs that have come your way the pension for teachers, the national insurance contributions, uh, the curriculum changes, uh, all of these things are additional costs. And with that cut in funding, you're not always, well, not covered for those uh, things. There's also a very big maintenance backlog in our schools. The department under Jonathan Slater, of course, who's no longer now permanent secretary, was actually beginning to get a grip of a stock survey of schools across the country and understand what assets there were, what the backlog was, including, we're a bit worried about, it's a bit, a bit slow on asbestos, I won't go into that today. But the capital funding uh, side of things is a very big issue uh, too. Um, and the government set targets for schools about increasing efficiency, uh, including on procurement, so that you could see if they could encourage you to buy your energy more cheaply. Of course, as chair of the Public Accounts Committee, as a champion for taxpayers as a constituency MP I always want to see schools do things like that but actually what we heard in very clear evidence and I'd be interested to hear from school leaders today is you're doing that already you've squeezed yourselves in most cases till the pips are squeaking and there isn't really much fat left to cut uh, and it's you know fair enough to cut on things like energy costs to pay for other things but it's a different matter when you're having to deal with harder decisions um, about where those cuts fall and we know that with the funding situation as it is it's teachers that will be, be going because that's the way to save money in a school. It's not easy to do it any other way. And we also know that of course with COVID, those teachers are particularly important as we're playing catch up with so many of our young people. I just thought it's worth also just touching on academies. Academies are treated slightly differently in the budget and the government accounting because they produce their um, accounts in a, on a different time scale. So they're now consolidated and we see we have a session every year as a committee looking at academies accounts and 168 academies in 2018-19 had a cumulative deficit of 64 million pounds but what we don't see is transparency over that so for other schools and i'm not making a particular judgment about academies i've got a lot in my my constituency i have to say who are educating children very well but it's the the fun, financial structure i'm talking about today they're not very transparent. If you're an academy chain, and there may be some academy chain heads on, on the call, I don't know, very often there isn't accountability at the local school level, it's at group level. So it's very difficult for parents and anyone with an interest to follow through how money is being spent. Now, of course, there can be some benefits to those economies of scale as you share expert teachers across a group, but that lack of transparency is something that's concerned my committee um, for quite some time. So, I mean, th that really is a, a very a small canter through. We, we have raised a lot of concerns about that, the, vi the vi viability of schools. If you take a percentage funding cut uh, and you encourage schools as the department has to make efficiency savings, we point out that in a small school, for example, 
a small single form entry primary school would be a good typical example. A small cut actually could lose a member of staff compared with uh, a bigger school that might be able to absorb it more easily and that they need to be much more sensitive about um, these changes. And one of the things that will be coming, of course, is the uh, change to the funding formula, which we wait to see how that pans out. But we know that there's a very big issue um, around special educational needs. And we did a report on that very recently, which I commend you. Um, and we're very con concerned generally about the impact, obviously on the children, but also on schools that are being asked to do more with less in that respect as well. So it feels like schools are being pushed in all directions to save money. Uh, and in the current climate, while money is obviously a huge issue nationally, and we don't know how we're going to pay back. Have we just, I think we may have just lost. Okay, I'm sorry, day. apologies, apologies. Thank you to the interpreter who pointed that out to me. Um, sorry, I just hit the wrong button. Uh, yeah, just saying that in the current situation, it shouldn't be schools that lose out because that's, that's our future generations that will be losing out. But it is a real concern and it'll be really interesting to hear during uh, to this afternoon's conference, um, what, what actual practical hard decisions school leaders are having to take right now because that will help me as I hold the government to account. I should say that uh, I hold the government to account in, in different ways. So we do look at reports from the National Audit Office. But we also call in permanent secretaries at different times on different issues, just to remind them about what they promised us they will do and to challenge them on some of their spending plans generally. So if you have information, do watch out. And you can contact me and I can put you in touch with the, the relevant uh, email addresses to send you evidence to us because it really helps us as a committee if when we're challenging government, yes, of course, we are over the numbers and we challenge them on that detail, but that we also remind the officials in Whitehall that the impact of their decisions and actions has a yeah, human impact, a real impact on schools and pupils at the grassroots level. And so those real life examples are a good example. And I mean, I take the Whitehaven Academy was a very good example of where um, some brave parents took on the management of the school there and the department. And we were able to amplify that through the committee. So please do feed in. I can't, I can't take up every issue, but please do feed in because that general information uh, is very, very helpful to us. But I'll leave it there and I'm happy to take questions, of course. Thank you very much for that, Meg. Uh, and as I said before, we very much appreciate your time this evening. And it's great to have the opportunity to ask questions to the Chair of the Public Accounts Committee. Um, we're going to hear from our other panellists on the mini panel around the detail of school funding uh, before we pose any questions to Meg. Um, but I please please do uh, ask any questions via the Q&A button at the bottom. As I said, it's quite helpful if you can say who you would like your question addressed to, if it's a specific question for one of our speakers. Um, and also you can upvote questions if you particularly want to hear a question answered as we will do them in a, in a vague order of uh, popularity. Um, so we're next going to move to hear from Luke Sibieta. Luke uh, is from the Institute of Financial Studies um, and he uh, is the author of the recent report that uh, you may have read on school funding. So I'll hand over to you, Luke. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks very much, Laura. Um, so I'm uh, Luke Sibieta. I'm a research fellow at the Institute for Fiscal Studies, and I lead the uh, work we do on e education spending. Um, for any uh, uh, Welsh attendees, I should say I'm also the author of an independent review of school, school, school spending in Wales, which will be published tomorrow. Um, I'd love to talk to you about that, but I'm afraid it won't come out until tomorrow. Um, so I'm going to give you an overview of what's happened to school spending over the last decade and the extent to which schools are well prepared, are, are well resourced and well prepared for the many challenges they face, including COVID, but also the many pre-existing challenges as well. Um, so over the last decade, we've seen a 9% reduction in spending per pupil. Um, that's mainly been driven by falls in local authority spending and falls in sixth form funding. Um, it comes on the back of a real terms increase in spending per pupil of about 60% over the 2000s. Um, however, um, uh, clearly a 9% fall is a, a, a large drop in historical terms. 
Um, the government has committed to increase school, school funding by 7 billion um, by 2022. But even after adding that money, school spending per pupil will be about the same or just below um, what it was in 2009-10. Um, and no growth, no real terms growth in school spending over 13 years is obviously a very significant squeeze um, by historical standards. Um, but ju just to give an example, I think the, the, lower, the next lowest change in spending over a 13 year period would probably be an 18% increase. So over the last 40 years, I don't think we've ever seen um, uh, a period of where we've seen no growth in school funding over 13 years. Um, but just as important as the overall level is how school funding is, is distributed. And given the likely inequalities that might be generated by COVID and, and, and the lockdown, um, a key consideration is the extent to which funding is focused on more disadvantaged or deprived schools. Um, so it, it's worth seeing this in historical context as well. Um, so in the year 2000, um, disadvantaged schools, most um, deprived schools received about 20% extra funding per pupil than the least disadvantaged schools. That gap went up to about 35% by 2010, as the then late Labour government significantly increased um, funding streams that were really quite heavily targeted at more disadvantaged schools. Um, that extra uh, funding premium then went down to about 25% by 2018. Um, that's a, a bit of a puzzle, um, as the pupil premium was introduced over that period too. Um, which is naturally a funding stream highly focused on more disadvantaged schools. So what's going on here? And um, well, the answer is that local authorities were changing. Um, in London, for example, was becoming gradually less, less deprived over time, according to official statistics. Um, and other towns and cities, particularly coastal towns, were becoming more deprived over time. Um, a good example here is Blackpool, which is a, an area that's become much more deprived over the last 10 years. Um, and the problem over the last 10 years has been that funding was not responding to these changes. Funding was being preserved as it was in, 10 years ago and not accounting for the fact that local authorities have changed. This in effect is a cost of not having previously reformed the school funding system for about 10, 15 years. In the long run, the national funding formula should help address some of these problems in principle because it's a funding system that's actually based on how schools look at their characteristics at any one point in time. So one could, of course, argue about whether the national funding form is structured right, but it's totally better to have a formula than not having a formula at all. Um, however, in the short run, the government has chosen to make funding more targeted on the least uh, deprived set of schools by using a large amount of the 7 billion um, to create these new minimum funding levels for schools. Uh, uh, the minimum funding levels are just over £4,000 of primary schools and £5,000 of secondary schools. That's probably going to make funding a bit less well targeted at the most disadvantaged schools. Um, as a result, that leaves disadvantaged schools relatively exposed at the moment. Um, they probably face some of the biggest challenges um, from the current pandemic and particularly the inc likely increases in education inequalities. They likely face the largest increases um, in teacher pay as well, as disadvantaged schools um, are much more likely to employ new or less experienced teachers who are likely to receive the biggest increases um, in teacher pay over the next few years. I, I think the increases in teacher pay are, and the structure of them are actually a relatively sensible change and welcome reform. Um, however, the government has, hasn't necessarily aligned the funding system with the plan changes in teacher pay. Um, and as a result, dis most disadvantaged schools face probably some of the biggest challenges over the, over the next few years, having received some of the lowest funding increases and biggest cuts over the last decade. Um, so that creates some real challenges at the moment. Thank you very much. <laughs> Luke. No, that's great. Thank you very much. Um, and we appreciate you being here and being able to share the detail, uh, particularly in terms of the report that you've uh, published. And we look forward to reading your report on Wales tomorrow. Um, now I'm going to move on to Andrew Baisley, who uh, is from the NEU.
Andrew has spent the last few years looking in detail at the statistics that have been involved in school funding and was one of the very much uh, the driving forces between the school uh, school cuts website and um, a lot of the detail that was on there. So thank you very much, Andrew, for joining us and we'll be delighted to hear from you. Thank, um, thank you very much. And before doing those numbers, I was a secondary maths teacher in Camden for, for 20 years. Um, I, wanted to, I, I wanted to show you some slides, but I think I've been banned from doing that. Um, but um, I will <laughs> vaguely talk to them. So I was, I, I've taken actually the work of the National Audit Office, which looked at the, uh, in their report, the financial um, feasibility of schools and continued that, um, they, in that they produced a school cost index and I tried to maintain that um, going forward. And then I've looked at actual individual school allocations for the last five years and tracked that against um, those school costs. And um, the National Audit Office predicted back in 2016 that if the government didn't put more money into into schools, then there'd be a three billion funding gap by this year. And that almost came to pass. Um, I've, I've, I have had a slide that would show you it's steadily increasing over four years with the, the worst year being last year where there was a funding gap of 2.4 billion. However, that, has, that corner has now been turned and, and this year it's come down to 2.1 billion pounds. And then based on the allocations from national funding formula for next year, it comes down a little bit more to 1.9 billion. But even despite the additional 7 billion pounds that Luke was talking about, I think it's extremely unlikely for the schools block to be returned to where it was in 2015 um, prices um, by the end of the period. And the consequence of that is that most schools have had um, a, a, school, a shortfall in funding. For the first three years, it was um, over 90% of schools. That's changed somewhat this year. Um, I, I estimate that 75% of schools currently have, um, have less money than they would in, in real terms um, than four years ago. However, that doesn't actually change next year because with the folding in of the money from the teacher's pensions grant and the teacher pay grant, that, that actually shifts the distribution of funding. And so there is, so relatively speaking, I think that primary schools do quite badly out of that. And therefore, more school, slightly more schools end up with a funding shortfall next year. Now, the long term, the impact of that in sort of real classrooms is, is seen, I think, very clearly in class sizes, because that is an efficient, that's the essential efficiency saving that can be made in a school. Um, most, most particularly in secondary schools. Luckily, there is a law about primary class sizes that caps them at 30. And consequently, they haven't shifted that much for the last five years. However, over the same period, secondary class sizes have rapidly increased and they are now stand at 22 per class, up from 20 per class, which doesn't sound a vast number, but it is the highest point um, uh, it is a high point. The last time it was that high was back in the year 2000. And the previous time that it was that high was back in the 1970s, 1978. So on an historic, historically, class sizes in secondary schools are, are at a high. And I guess in the context of COVID, the point about that is, is that you've got more children in large classes particularly in secondary schools, than we've seen since the early 1980s. Um, one, in, uh, one in seven secondary pupils is in a class of more than 30 pupils at the moment. The other, the other thing that's been, I think, that's been very dramatic change in funding, and I'll wind up very quickly, is about 
um, high needs funding because the number of children with an education and healthcare plan has really risen very dramatically over the last few years. It was only a quarter of a million back in 2015, and this year stands now at 300, over 390,000 pupils, an absolutely phenomenal rise. And that's led to a huge shortfall in funding to try and fund those those places and those plans that's left so that even though the government has put in large sums, large amounts of um, funding for schools is being put into the high needs block, it's never actually catching up with the demand that's been created. Um, and so um, I think there's almost, a, if you were to try and restore the value of an EHCP to its value just five years ago, that would cost almost two billion pounds all on its own. So I think that despite the additional funding we've seen from the government, schools face immense challenges um, still. Um, and I don't, I, I, I not clearly the, um, the effect of the COVID crisis is only going to put more and more demands on schools. Um, there you go, that's it. Thank you very much for that, Andrew. Um, so just a reminder that please do ask questions in the Q&A box, which is at the bottom of the screen. Uh, don't ask questions in the chat, but do feel free to interact with each other via there. Um, and after we've heard from our final speaker in this section, Julie, I'd also uh, be very willing if any of the panellists have any questions for any of the other panellists or would like to engage in some discussion, uh, you'd be very welcome to do that. Uh, but we'll first hear from our final speaker in this section, and that is Julie Cordoner, who is from School of Financial Success. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Julie Cordner and I'm an independent uh, education funding specialist. So my focus is on helping schools achieve strong financial leadership and goodness knows we all need that now, don't we? Um, so I'd like to focus on a couple of specific issues which I think we'll need to deal with in the next couple of years specifically to as context really for the problems that we're having with the COVID costs and my main concern, Andrew's already touched on this, is high needs. And this is for mainstream as well as specialist settings. I think chickens will come home to roost on this. My take on the high needs national funding formula is that it's a completely unfair distribution of nowhere near enough money. And the two things are very closely, closely related. There's far too much waiting on historic spend and population, just ordinary pupil population, and only 26% is currently allocated on any sort of needs-based indicators, and they're a bit woefully out of date or incomplete. So that means, I think, that the formula is completely unresponsive to changes in need. And while it's true and very welcome that high needs funding is increasing, there's an extra one and a half billion this year and next year together in total. If we don't have an, a fit for purpose formula, then it's not going to, that extra money isn't going to reach where it needs to go. So the areas with the biggest challenges, which tend to be the ones that are at a high disadvantage, um, they may miss out and not get the extra funding they need. And we will have to wait now until 2022 to 23 for any change in the distribution between the schools block and the high needs block because the special needs review has been delayed and won't report until next spring. That's far too long to wait when we've got a system which all the reports agree is broken. So unless a magic money tree appears from somewhere, and again, that's in a bit short supply, isn't it, at the moment with the Brexit and COVID, you just need to say those two words, don't you? Any extra high needs funding is bound to come by being transferred from the schools block. So what does that mean? There's less for mainstream schools. And this is just a, a, a cycle of, of doom, really. Everybody's already suffering. I know I've seen in the comments, some people are already saying this, you know, we're having static allocations of top up funding. It hasn't changed for goodness knows how long. Uh, well, probably since the start of the system. So schools are absorbing an awful lot of costs. And this will continue to create the disincentives or increase the disincentives to be inclusive, as well as deficits. They will inevitably continue to increase. So I believe that the review of 
special needs will be absolutely crucial, but, but it is cloaked in secrecy. We can't see any minutes. We don't know what the time scales really are for consultation and where the proposals will be focused. So I, I don't have a lot of time to, to expand, but I did do a blog recently titled The Invisible Send Review on my School Financial Success website. So you can go and read a bit more about the gap between funding and costs there. Just very quickly, another couple of, of points. I think what we're seeing with COVID has exposed a fundamental problem with the school funding system. And that is, as uh, we heard earlier, there's a big proportion of funding that's allocated on pure pupil numbers. And that's increasing with the pay and pensions grants and the catch up uh, premium. But we organize schools, not on the basis of individual pupils, but on classes. And so whenever you're having to respond differently to the way your classes are organized, you're going to have problems because you can absorb so many extra pupils. And as soon as you need another class, you've got this big step up and you need a lot of extra staff, staffing and resources. So in future, I think we're going to need to pay a lot more attention to how costs behave and different types of costs behave at different levels of pupil numbers. And I think that's a piece of work that really would be a good thing, good thing to do. And finally, um, we have had increases, yes, but, and, and these increases over, the next, over this three year period are always cited as the reason for the government not funding additional cost pressures like the 2020 teachers pay award, like the COVID costs. But the reality is that as long as we are re continuing to redistribute funding through the national funding formula, many schools will not see those national increases. Some will only get half a percent per pupil per year. And so you can see where this tension is going to come from. And I am still skeptical as to whether, whether we'll ever see the national funding formula. <laughs> uh, there's too many technical and practical problems, but that's for another day because I've run out of time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Julie, and thank you for being concise within that. And I think it's particularly interesting, both yourself and Andrew, to, to highlight the issue of high needs funding um, and ensuring that the money is there to give what is needed in the HCPs. So thank you very much for that. Um, we're going to move on to questions in a moment. But first of all, I'm going to launch the first of our two polls for this evening. So hopefully it should be appearing on your screen now. The question is, do you think government should reimburse the additional costs incurred by each school as a result of implementing COVID-19 safety measures? And it's a multiple choice question. Um, yes, government should cover all COVID related costs. Yes, but government should cover some additional, should give some additional funds towards the COVID-19 costs. No, it should come from, from existing budgets or don't know. And uh, you'll have about uh, up to 10 minutes, which is the amount of time we'll be dealing with questions from this first panel to answer that. Uh, so thank you to everybody who has posed a question. Um, very much appreciate that. Um, the first question I'm gonna ask, I've seen that Meg Hillier would like to answer this. So I'm gonna put it to Meg. It's from Richard Marshall. It's the most popular question we've had tonight. He is concerned about funding in my school in relation to COVID costs. We have been told to put into a COVID cost code. However, there is no certainty about whether this will actually be reimbursed. The only reassurance has been for schools whom the cost will put them into a deficit position. Has a commitment been made for the cost of COVID to be picked up from government? So Meg, if you'd like to answer that, please. Uh, and I would also flag that Ian Mearns MP, uh, my colleague who's on the Education Select Committee, uh, at least one member of the Education Select Committee is on the call, there may be others, sorry if I've missed anyone, I can't see every um, Interrupter, sorry, uh, interpreter, interrupter, interpreter, in, interrupted, I'm sorry, I put two words together. Um, could you remove the um, poll from my screen, because I'm pretty sure that if anybody's using the interpreter they can't see me. I can't, I can, if, you, you, I, if you vote on it, it will disappear from your screen. So just click a, click to vote in it. Apologies for that. We can see you if that's any help. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. Um, 
yes, yeah, so there may be, so members of the Education Select Committee will no doubt have thoughts on this as well. But look, at the moment, it's not certain what money will come to schools directly. Local authorities are already being underfunded for what they're spending on COVID. What I would say is that the Treasury, we've pushed them to keep a track right from the right from day one when people were saying, save lives, don't look at the money. I said, no, we must keep looking at the money because if we don't, there'll be huge problems down the line as we're already beginning to see. So keep attaching it to that cost code, keep measuring it, but be very careful about how you measure it because the Treasury by default will always assume we're being profligate, that we're spending, you know, that you, you, local authorities are just splashing money around unnecessarily. I, I overemphasize for effect, but they will want to know that there isn't dead weight money in there, that you're not adding into those cost centers, things that you would automatically, you should already be paying for, even if you don't have enough money normally, you do need to be clear why it's COVID specific. So things like extra supply teachers is relatively straightforward over your normal averages. But if there's any way you can measure against your normal spend in normal years, particularly over more than one year, say over a three year period, and you've got those figures, you're, if you're a big secondary or a multi-academy trust, this should be easy to do. You need to be watching that because the treasury will be looking closely at it. And if you're an academy, of course, you're funded directly from government. Um, and if you're, a local authority school, there will be a wrangle between councils or the education authorities and the department potentially over this. My worry is that if they pay for COVID, there may be issues around the per pupil funding, but they have announced that the increase per pupil per head for 2021-22, I put it in the chat. Uh, well, I don't need to give you the figures right now, but that is supposed to go up, but that won't cover anywhere near your COVID costs. So unless, I don't know if the Education Select Committee members can come in on the chat if, they, if they've got any other information, um, but it's, it, it is really important you just get your bean counters in the school. It really matters now. If you're not watching every penny, don't expect to get it back later. I think there is a real concern there. And, you know, for a small primary, I was a, a, a chair of governors in a very small primary when I started out uh, 20 something years ago. Um, and I'm aware that there isn't much financial resource in those situations, but you do need to be watching it really closely and pinning it down. So sorry, it's not good news at the moment, but a lot in flux. Thank you very much for that, Meg. Um, I've got a second question, which is one of my most popular ones. Um, Luke, I'm going to address it to you, but please let me know if you don't feel you're the best person to answer it. So it's from Nick Watkins. Um, he says, I agree that we have cut our general expenses as far as we can, and it is only staffing left to cut. My biggest problem in a primary of 215 children it is only viable if we have 30 children in a class. However, the birth rate does not support this. What do we do? You able to unmute yourself, Luke? Thank you. That's fine. I did, I'm just finding the button, sorry. Um, so I think the um, the only thing I can I can really say is that I, I, I understand the problem. It's um, funding, overall funding has been cut by around 9% um, over the last 10 years. Um, and whilst I'm sure in the period between 2010, 2015, there are some efficiency savings that could be made by changing this, that and the other. Um, when you get a 9% cut over 10 years, that will inevitably have to lead to changes in staffing. And so it's, it's a very similar question. I, I, I get at many events, and unfortunately, I, I I can't give you advice on what to do. Um, my, I I seek to highlight the changes over time, and the extent to which they they reflect um, uh, changes in costs. And clearly, they haven't affected changes in costs at the moment. Um, with permission, I'd also like to address an earlier question that's been uh, uh, thumbed up quite a lot on um, the the overall uh, level of the catch-up funding. Um, and, and so that's one thing we looked at quite a lot in detail in our recent report on school spending. And obviously a billion pounds as it's framed sounds like quite a lot of money. Um, however, the, it, it becomes smaller and looks insufficient when you get into the detail of it. So for example, the catch-up funding of 80 pounds um, uh, per pupil, that equates to about £2,400, say, for a class of 30 children. Um, and I'm sure lots of the head teachers can do, 
you can do the maths about what that buys you. Um, according to our very back of the envelope calculations, that buys you maybe 10% of the cost of an additional teaching assistant for a year. So the extent to which that the catch up funding will be able to significantly address some of the COVID inequalities and COVID challenges is probably, it, it's, it's a modest stream of funding. Um, the national tutoring program is about 250 million and we would probably buy about six hours of um, tuition um, for about 1.4 million pupils and that's probably not going to be enough to address a lot of the losses in learning during lockdown so one of the things we sought to highlight in the report was that uh, at the moment the level of catch-up funding appears to be insufficient given the challenges that schools are facing. Thank you very much for that, Luke. Um, I'll just this moment invite if any of the panelists have got any questions for any for either Meg, Luke, Andrew or Julie. Anybody just wants to indicate? No. OK, thank you for that. And thank you to all our speakers in this panel. Um, I'm going to move on just because we've, we've got quite a lot of uh, speakers on our agenda for this evening and we're trying to uh, fit as many people in as possible. But I do very much appreciate all the contributions we've had so far and all the questions. And um, please do stay for the rest of uh, the meeting. Um, I'm going to close the poll. So the first poll we asked, do you think that government should reimburse the additional costs incurred by each school as a result of implementing COVID-19 safety measures? 78% of you said yes, the government should cover all COVID related costs in schools. 21% said the government, each government should give schools some additional funds towards COVID-19 costs and nobody thought it should come from existing budgets and nobody said don't know. So that is quite a strong uh, display of feeling uh, and thank you very much to everybody who participated in that poll. We're now going to move on to hear about the experience of school funding. We've heard that uh, schools over the last 10 years have had one of the schools in England have had one of the largest drops in funding since the 1980s, that's from the IFS report, and we've got this perfect storm of COVID safety measures having increased costs and also loss of income because of not being able to do things like hiring out school premises. Um, so it's a lot of things mixing together. So we're really keen to hear from a variety of different perspectives from in school. Um, and the first person we're going to be hearing from is uh, Emily Prophet, who is a head teacher in Staffordshire and is representing the F40 group tonight. Thank you very much, Emily. Good evening, everybody. Um, yeah, I'm here on dual purpose today. So I'm here as a head teacher uh, but I'm also representing the F40 group, which is made up of a cross section of groups since education across the country, uh, representing over 40 local authorities that are underfunded historically. Um, it includes head teachers, councillors, union members, the National Governance Association, specialist schools throughout the education ranges, and many more bodies. We as a group were delighted um, that there was recognition of the funding issues last year during the election. However, the reality is that the funding fell far short of our expectations. There are still far too many disparities in how funding is applied with lack of fairness and transparency across the country. Unfortunately, since then, the picture has been further impacted upon by COVID um, and the teachers' pay increases as well as further added to that, um, allowing, making it impossible for schools to operate efficiently financially, particularly in the poorest funded areas. Budget forecasts and predictions are simply black holes and are crystal balls about future spending, let alone how COVID will continue to challenge us, are actually broken. Whilst funding has gone some way to rectify differences between areas, it has not yet um, been implemented fairly enough in our view. In fact, fairness of funding in schools across our country does not exist. It is far more complex than a funding formula. Schools in my local area, Staffordshire, receive far less money than authorities, uh, for example, in London, um, which has already been referred to today. This is an extreme, and I'm aware that the cost of living are higher, but it goes far beyond that. It is a myth that leafy shires are well off and the pupils have more than enough. I myself am a rural head teacher and have been a small school head teacher for many years. Every penny is stretched thinly and more often than not, decisions have to be made about staffing levels, whether we can afford CPD and even resources for our pupils, leaving us far less on the ground than other authorities. 
It's simply not acceptable that we have to fight for every penny for every child when other areas have far more. A child is a child and they have a right to equality of education provision no matter where they live. Currently, we are existing in a postcode lottery. And unfortunately for my postcodes, we are losing out. F40 has worked close, closely with local authorities on the issues that exist with SEND also. We were disappointed that the SEND review was postponed due to COVID, as this is um, an area that desperately needs developing. We are hopeful that this will be prioritised for future, but a date is yet to be announced. Our schools and local authorities are drastically underfunded within Staffordshire with SEND, meaning that schools cannot simply accommodate the needs presented and our local authorities are burdened by massive deficits. Special schools are overrun and specialist provision in mainstream settings is inadequate for what is needed. With lead practitioners across the country, um, F F40 have consulted with Tony McArdle, an independent appointed on the SEND Review Advisory Committee. We have identified the need to remove EHCPs and adjust the way in which spending is allocated fairly. Schools need to be properly resourced, trained and supported to be more inclusive. This is costly but will have a greater long-term impact moving forward. To support this, the high stakes accountability also needs to be addressed. It's far more than funding. As a head teacher, it frustrates me. We have the will and determination to be inclusive for all, but for some children, what we have in physical resource, trained staff and facilities is insufficient. All of the head teachers that I talk to are passionate about every child, but our system is simply not set up to support them. Finally, we move on to COVID implications and the complications, which F40 are increasingly more and more concerned about. Aside from the physical strain, stress and pressure on schools it's having, and will continue to have a drastic impact on schools budgets not just in the poorest funded areas but for all of us. Schools have been forgotten or at the very left best left out. The financial noose that we already have around our necks from decades of underfunding as addressed today is being tightened every day. Schools have no choice through Covid guidance and to put in measures that are rightly there to protect and support our schools to stay open. Extra resources, additional staff for lunch times, increased heating bills, we have to ventilate our schools, cover costs of staff being tested, isolated or worse off actually getting test, uh, results for COVID, loss of income generators and much more. My school has already seen real term losses of between 15 and 20 thousand pounds with other schools locally reporting even more. Schools cannot take the burden of additional costs. We have not had the ability to plan for this and we do not have the ability to predict what is coming. We need to remain open for the economy and for our children, but financially we are further crippled without any lifelines currently from the Treasury. Put simply, fund all schools fairly and do not leave any people out, as it's their right to have an education. Thank you. Thank you very much for that contribution, Emily. And it's great to hear from F40 Group and from a rural school perspective. Um, now we're going to move on to hear uh, from the Sixth Form Colleges Association and James Kewin. Thanks everyone, good afternoon. Uh, unsurprisingly I'm going to talk about Sixth Form funding. Uh, as many of you will know, Sixth Form funding sits outside uh, the national funding formula. Um, but I think it's fair to say we have not fared well over the past 10 years in terms of uh, funding and Luke has done some great work uh, with colleagues at the IFS to, to, to highlight that. Um, just in, in terms of a very quick bit of background, we actually saw three very deep cuts to funding after 2010. Um, so then on top of that, in common with all of you, big increase in running costs, of course. Um, I think one thing that hasn't come up today is that government has become much more demanding over the past 10 years. And of course, the needs of students in many respects have become more complex. So in a sense, the purchasing power of uh, funding is just diminished so much over the past decade. It's not simply uh, a matter of funding cuts, it's what uh, in very crude terms that funding will, uh, will buy you. So I think what we've seen in the sixth form world is what I would describe as a, a triple narrowing of the uh, sixth form experience. Uh, first of all, we've just seen uh, students now take fewer subjects. Um, it wasn't that long ago that four subjects was the norm, in some cases even five. Um, 
Of course, there were changes to A-level reforms, which drove some of this, but fundamentally, uh, just in affordability terms, three subjects is the norm because that's all we can afford uh, to put on in schools and colleges. Uh, the second aspect is also a reduction in the, in the range of subjects that are available uh, 16 to 18. For example, big reduction uh, in modern foreign languages and other strategically important, significant subjects, but with small class sizes. Uh, and many schools and colleges have found they're simply, uh, they're simply not viable. And the third element is uh, extracurricular activities and um, student support. Extracurricular in particular, really important for social mobility, this kind of so-called levelling up uh, agenda. To give you an indication, uh, a young person that attends an independent school uh, receives more, uh, the average fee in a term is about £500 more than a state sixth form student gets for an entire year. So there is a gulf between the public and the private uh, uh, sectors uh, in that regard. And of course, in terms of student support, uh, students have never needed uh, more support than they do now. But school and college leaders will attest when it comes to sixth form, there's nowhere else to go. I think also something that can get lost is that the, the impact of cuts to sixth form funding ju doesn't just affect sixth form students. Most schools have to cross subsidise their sixth form uh, with the funding intended for younger students. So um, it is something that goes beyond uh, the boundaries simply of, uh, of, uh, of sixth formers. So I think where we end up is almost a kind of a, a part-time sixth form experience. If you look at the, um, the countries that the government likes to talk about and compare us to, Shanghai, Singapore, uh, even Canada and, 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 and um, Sweden and places, typically there in the sixth form, you're getting around 30 hours of tuition and, and support and compare that to the 14 or 15 hours that we're getting uh, in England because the funding doesn't allow us to put uh, on any more in that. So this sustained underinvestment has been really bad for uh, teaching and support staff. It's testament to them really that despite all of the kind of the doom and gloom, there haven't been many laughs in what I've said so far, despite all of that, they've managed to keep the show on the road because they've had to do more with less uh, for 10 years now. It's been bad for the financial health of institutions. If you look at how the financial health of schools and colleges has deteriorated over 10 years, that's very striking and the government will catch a cold if it doesn't address that uh, 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 soon as well. Um, and, and one thing that um, surprises me consistently is the government doesn't appreciate that actually it's bad for their objectives too. They've set out very ambitious uh, objectives in terms of social mobility and productivity and the industrial strategy. But if you continue to underinvest in this pivotal stage of education at 16 to 18, they're all going to be dashed. Um, so, you know, it, for them, in terms of their policy objectives, it makes sense to get investment uh, levels right. There is another way, uh, NHT, ASCOL, Worth Less, we're all part of the Raise the Rate uh, Coalition. And that really is the kind of the main uh, ask uh, when it comes to the forthcoming spending review. I'll come to that in a sec. But one thing we do is an annual funding impact survey, which highlights uh, what uh, has happened in the sixth form world. And we've seen 51% uh, in the last survey of schools and colleges have cut uh, modern foreign languages, 38% have cut STEM courses, 81% are teaching students in larger class sizes, and 78% have reduced student support uh, and extracurricular activity. So this is a fairly kind of grisly picture, um, but there is a way to change that. We have a really high stakes spending review on the horizon uh, and the government has the opportunity to reverse uh, some of these cuts to address the fundamental under investment uh, in there. And in a sense, and I'm sure Meg will be interested in this, increasingly for us in the sixth form world, it's almost as important how the funding appears as how much. One thing we saw during COVID, but in the sixth form world, we've seen this for years now, small pots of money here and there. The DfE blame the treasury for this, that they want to hypothecate everything, you know, more money for certain qualifications or uh, certain subjects. And the really mundane truth is that school and colleges just need a higher rate of core funding. Schools and colleges are the experts. They can say how student funding should be directed. Uh, we don't need Whitehall telling us how to spend uh, this cash. So that's why we've got a very, very simple message ahead of the uh, uh, spending review. I'm sure you'll forgive me the plug, but raise the rate, it's raisetherate.org.uk. Loads of stuff on the website. Everyone here today is behind it. Um, 
But to date, this underinvestment has been bad for staff, it's been bad for students, it's been bad for uh, the government, uh, it's bad for social mobility, for the economy. There is another way. They have an opportunity at the spending review. And if we work together, hopefully we can ensure they take it. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, James. And I, I know that uh, talking about doing more for less is something that I think most of the, uh, the school staff and governors on this meeting can identify with. Uh, so we're going to move from hearing about the experience and the settings of some of our older pupils to some of our younger pupils. Uh, we're going to be hearing from Tara Entwistle, who is the head teacher of a maintained nursery school in Lancashire. Thank you very much, Tara. If you unmute yourself, please, Tara. Sorry, are you able to do that? Oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, yeah, quite hard acts to follow there, really, because um, I've just not really um, prepared anything because uh, I've only sort of um, realised that I was coming on to this today. But so I'm just going to speak from the heart, really, which is generally what I do. So I'll try not to uh, put my foot in anything. <laughs> but, uh, um, but, um, I think from a from a maintained nursery school point of view, everything that everybody's already said, um, from the points that Meg made in the beginning and to what Luke said, to what you know the other school leaders have said, every single one of those difficulties that each different part of the sector is facing, we are facing in maintained nursery schools. Every single one of the, the, the issues with the high needs funding, with deprivation funding, with the um, impact on, on rising staff costs. Um, small school issues that small schools have. Um, every single one of those affects us as a maintained nursery school. We've had the same issues that everybody's faced since 2010, rising costs, um, in funding um, not rising um, at a level to cover that. Um, but as a, you know, I think somebody talked about a, a, like a, a triple whammy. We, we also in maintained nursery schools have had the issue um, that compounded that when, um, the introduction of the early years national funding formula came in. Um, already, you know, struggling um, with, with funding uh, since 2010 with the introduction of single funding formula. When, when, when the early years national funding formula came in in 2017, um, it, it, it obviously that was was uh, not going to bring uh, the funding into to nursery schools at the rate that it was, and we were already um, around about 40%. Uh, down uh, on previous funding. So um, obviously um, through the work of the APPG and, and, and various um, uh, things, the, um, we had um, some transition funding agreed um, to sort of get us through to where we could bring our rates, uh, our, you know, our costs down to a level that would be covered um, by this new formula. So schools, although, so as maintained nursery schools, we have all the same statutory duties uh, as, as any school, um, but we're not funded in the same way as schools. So not only do we face the same funding difficulties, we have even more difficulties because uh, of, that we've got the statutes and the costs associated with being a school, but we're funded um, in a way that's based on pupil to pupil, term by term, very uncertain and very unpredictable finances that are in no way uh, covering costs. So um, the... the um, that the transition fund, funding really has left us uh, in a limbo position. Um, we were sort of a, we were hanging on to the hope about the upcoming spending review, uh, and maybe that that would provide an opportunity for long term stability, um, for you know what we see as a crucial part of, of the sector. Just as you know, the sixth form sits outside. You know, we do in many respects, but we all know the research. We all know the impact of early years. We all know that children are developing at the fastest rate ever. The ability to narrow the gap, to catch up, and to enter the school at a point where children, you know, are, are, are nearer to where they should be, um, you know, can, is is being closed by maintained nursery schools. We um, serve um, some of the areas of the highest deprivation. We've got highest proportion of children with SCND across any sector with the highest performing sector um, in terms of Ofsted um, outcomes, 98% um, good and outstanding. Um, and yet we're, you know, we're critically underfunded and um, are struggling to survive. We were on a cliff edge and um, since COVID, um, the effects are absolutely catastrophic. In my case, uh, in our school, 
um, we had quite a significant deficit, um, which we've um, had for a, a few years now. Um, we've worked very much on a business model, and that's the um, angle that our local authority supported us to go down. Uh, I think you know schools have, have been um, uh, sort of you know suggested that we work in this way, and we've done that. And actually, that's um, where we've come even more unstuck because of COVID. So around about fifty percent of our budget is made up by private income now. That's the business plan that we've worked to to make the nursery school sustainable. The nursery school had a, a larger deficit, which we had worked out um, uh, a successful recovery plan. Um, and by the end of 21-22, uh, we would have been back in the black. Um, because of all the actions that we've taken, um, doing more for less. We had 37 staff five years ago across our school. We're not for a school, we're quite unique in that respect. We've now got 17. Um, and we're still meeting statutory ratios and still raising standards all the time. Um, we've reviewed everything. We've cut costs everywhere. Most of our curriculum resource budget now is made up through fundraising. Um, we generate income through um, extended services through providing extra provision uh, and also through other weird and wonderful ways <laughs> um, down to you know making a little bit of profit on the uniform and um, the food that we have and all sorts of things that we do we've restructured we've restructured we've had redundancies uh, we've lost um, staff with a great deal of experience we're losing experienced um, committed people from the workforce. We're going to end up with a recruitment crisis that's already looming in teaching, but particularly in early years because of the pressure that we face. Um, so we had a sustainable business model um, and we've worked hard. It's not that money's lashing around. And I do think that, you know, there maybe has been um, a perception that nursery schools in particular have had money lashing around. Uh, we certainly haven't. And um, and, and now, you know, we've cut everything to the bone um, and, you know, we're, we're hanging off the cliff. Um, so the other um, thing that's affected uh, maintaining our schools, particularly because of COVID, is not only have we faced the increased costs, we've suffered from the loss of income, which is part of our business plan, makes up a lot of our deficit, that supports our budget. We've not been able to access the support um, any of the financial supports that's gone into schools or businesses. So even though we've been operating like a business, we haven't been able to benefit from the furlough scheme. We haven't been able to benefit from the reduction in business rates. We haven't had, we're not eligible for any of the catch up funding. We've not been eligible for the exceptional costs fund. So there's been, no, there isn't anything that nursery schools can tap into um, to support their associated costs around COVID. Um, I realise I'm probably running out of time, but I also just want to make the point about how, you know, as many schools have, we've filled the gap. Our staff have been on the front line. There was some um, research um, by early education um, about how double the amount of maintained nursery schools compared to private providers stayed open throughout lockdown, providing for, um, you know, a high level of vulnerable, but in my case, vulnerable and key worker children, a high number of key worker children. Um, the staff have worked throughout uh, on the front line. We've needed staff in because of the number of children we've had and, um, you know, the, the, the rotor and, and so on and so forth. Um, they've been going out doing home visits, keeping in contact with families, homeschool learning, remote learning, whilst working in ratio with children throughout. And that's really increased the, the stress and the workload for the staff um, who have been, you know, amazing and committed um, throughout all of this. Um, or also, obviously, I haven't been eligible for any remote learning or any of that funding either. <laughs> Tara, I'm just going to stop you there. I'm so sorry That's bad. for halting you because I can see you, you've, you've given an incredibly detailed description of, the, of what's been happening in your school. And thank you so much for being with us tonight and sharing that. Um, and thank you for everything that you've done to support children and families in your setting. Um, it's, it's, it's been an amazing achievement over the last few months. So thank you and pass that on to your colleague. Mm -hmm maintain nursery schools as well. Um, we're going to move on to hear from Dr Graham Galt, uh, who's going to give a Northern Ireland perspective on what funding is like uh, for him and his colleagues in Northern Ireland. Thank you, Dr Graham. Thank you, Laura. I'm speaking to you on behalf of school leaders in Northern Ireland, both as a school principal in County Armagh 
as you said, Laura, and as the Northern Ireland president of NAHT, we in Northern Ireland, as a society, are blessed to have a generation of children in our schools, which is vibrant, engaged and enthused about learning and development. Our children are wonderful and our children are our wealth. And we are blessed to have such wonderful school practitioners here who create places in which our children are taught and encouraged and stimulated and loved. And in this respect, uh, we are in fact the envy of many other countries. However, until January of this year, we were without a functioning devolved government for three long stagnant years. We were without a government that could prioritize education and promote the healthy growth and development of our children. And during this unacceptably prolonged period, our school leaders were crying out for help, but there was no one to hear. Individual politicians all had an interest in their constituencies and were genuinely dismayed by the troubles that their local school leaders were voicing, but collectively, as a political assembly of all parties, they were deaf and impotent and school leaders were left in all honesty, with nowhere to turn. And the truth is, school funding in Northern Ireland has decreased to levels that have never before been seen and which are significantly lower than all other areas across Ireland and the UK. This is despite increasing enrolments, increasing demand, increasing complexities and significantly higher levels of poverty. In the last decade, the annual education budget has contracted by well over 200 million pounds, not including the effects of uh, inflation. And this, at the same time, the school population has risen. The impact of this on the school estate has been cumulative. Ongoing underinvestment in the school estate has meant that many schools have waited for years for funding for essential capital projects and the condition of many other buildings has deteriorated significantly. Many of the school buildings in Northern Ireland are simply not fit for purpose and require extensive essential maintenance and repair. In terms of learning, quantifying the current impact and the future potential impact on learning of funding cuts in line with recognized indicators is very complex. But what we know from our members at the chalk face is that children are being profoundly impacted larger class sizes, a reduction in learning materials, a denial of professional development opportunities for teaching staff, these things will all inevitably lead to children receiving less support to meet their needs in their, uh, in their learning and in their development. And a number of very high profile reports into the state of provision for children with special educational needs have been published recently, casting a damningly bright light onto a broken and fragmented and inadequate system for most vulnerable children. In England, it appears to me that there is a much more coordinated approach to the education of children with special educational needs. In England, I understand each child with an identified need can receive an education, health and care plan. A single legal document that explains a child's needs is regularly reviewed and accompanies them throughout their education. This determines and coordinates the funding and support that each child will receive for their education from health and social care budgets. In contrast, Northern Ireland operates a piecemeal approach whereby health and education agencies provide a series of separate plans and documents and consequently, separate pots of funding are attributed to meet these needs. A lack of a coordinated cooperative approach between agencies fails to fully assess and address the needs of children and often prevents children with special educational needs from reaching their potential. And we believe that too great a percentage of the overall education budget is being withheld at centre in Northern Ireland and failing to reach frontline services. This means that direct investment in schooling in Northern Ireland lags significantly behind other systems. Spending on preschool, primary and secondary education per pupil is 40% higher in Scotland than it is here, 18% higher in England than it is here, 31% higher in Wales than it is here. In stark contrast to the other areas of the UK where between two and 10% of funding is retained at centre, schools in Northern Ireland only receive a maximum 
of 59% of the overall education budget directly, which means a shocking 41% was held at centre and exactly how that is used remains unclear. And this is so surprising when we know, of course, that it is those who are closest to the children who are best placed to meet their often complex and individual needs. And a direct result of this is that the basic funding for a school place in any sector is well over a thousand pounds per pupil less here than it is in other parts of the UK. Understandably, the arrival of COVID-19 has moved attention here to issues of public health, but the funding crisis is still here and is right now directly and visibly impacting on our children, significantly our most vulnerable children. And school leaders are reporting a universal lack of essential maintenance, significant redund re reductions in money spelt, spent on essential learning resources, increased costs being passed on to parents, reductions, and in many cases, the termination of essential support services, increased class sizes, reduced teaching and learning support staff, reduced and unbelievably in some cases, the total withdrawal of learning support for children with additional learning needs. These things are simply unacceptable. These outcomes are impacting our children and they are directly attributable to the failure of government. Laura, I see you there. I just in conclusion would tell you that there is something that fills me with hope. Our schools are filled with children who have learned in Northern Ireland how to negotiate how to learn daily in their playground interactions and in structured opportunities within schools to pre present themselves gently, to listen actively, to understand compassionately, to seek win-win outcomes and commonalities and to acknowledge difficult difficulties and to care without prejudice. And I believe our children will be the ones who hold our current government to account. Thank you very much, Graham, and thank you for that bit of positive hope at the end. Uh, it's it's very much appreciated to hear that because it has been quite a disparaging and a despairing picture that people have spoken. Thank you to all our speakers in this section who've talked about their own individual experiences. So apologies, uh, we were missing Chris Britton, who was going to speak from a special school and from a Welsh perspective. Um, but we are running uh, quite behind time, so we're going to move on to the next panel. So apologies, we won't be asking questions, uh, but I appreciate the contributions that you've all made and uh, we've, you, uh, we, uh, we've heard quite a lot from it um, and it's been very, very useful to hear your perspective. So thank you very much. So I'm going to move straight on to Jeff Barton, who is the General Secretary of ASCL. Thank you very much, Jeff. Thank you very much. Good evening, everybody, and very good to be here. Thank you for the invitation. I want to not repeat what you've heard already because we've had a compelling case, haven't we, about the issues. We've had it as a granular level from school and college leaders. We've had it at a level of people who have researched this. We've had it at a parliamentary level. So let's not repeat that. Instead, let's talk about the campaign and where we go from here. And I'll do it as quickly as I can because we haven't got a lot of time. I want to talk about three things. I want to say a little bit about the past, a little bit about the present, a little bit about the future. I think in terms of the past, if you look what we were able to do, we were able to move the issue of school funding significantly up the political agenda. And how did we do that? Well, we did it, I think, in two ways. And I think we need to learn the lesson from this because we're going to need it even more. We did it, first of all, through an extraordinary process of collaboration. So you had different unions with different political affiliations and perspectives, other organisations representing parents and governors, and other people, all of them coming together and saying there is a crisis going on here. And I think we were able to frame that in terms which suddenly started to cut through in a particular way. And I think the particular way we were able to do that was to locate it in what was happening to children. And we've heard a little bit about that tonight, that this ultimately isn't about finances. It's about social justice. It's about the child who doesn't have access to modern foreign languages or doesn't have access to music in their school because as we've already heard, class sizes have gone up and courses have been cut. And I think we need to remember that that is the way you build a campaign, speaking in a language which absolutely cuts through particularly. That's what we did in the past, and other people will reflect on that in a second. In terms of the present, we have a particular problem because you've got uh, a whole population who have heard all kinds of rhetorical promises, haven't they, from a government? which has talked about 14 billion pounds of additional funding, which has talked about a world beating catch up 
programme, which has talked about £30,000 starting salaries. And what we know, as we've heard from Luke, is when you start to drill underneath that, you start to see that it was rhetorical, that there is a serious issue. And that poses a challenge to us in terms of how do we explain that to parents? How do we cut through with all of that? Which takes us on to the issue of the future. And I think what you've got here is a government which has talked a lot about its red wall constituencies, has talked a lot about levelling up, which has talked a lot about its skills agenda. And I think what we need to demonstrate is, from the first part of what I said, this is a social mobility issue. It's now much more of a social mobility issue. And unless the government is able to invest in young people and teachers, then it's going to have a serious crisis on its hands. But we also know there's a public spending review about to start, and we will particularly need to be able to compete against other people, all of whom will be saying the same kind of thing and demonstrate why investing in young people the education profession is so important now. And I think the more we can harness what everybody has been saying here tonight and have a really strategic view of how we articulate that, that's what's gonna take us into the next phase. But I mentioned that we're gonna have this spending review. That's coming soon. So we need to marshal all the energy, all the fury that we've got tonight and make sure that we start to articulate a really strong case on behalf of children and young people across the nation. Thanks again for inviting me tonight. And thank you very much for joining us, Jeff. Uh, we appreciate hearing um, from yourself and from Askell. Um, we are now going to move to Alison Alley, if that's okay for you to speak now, Alison. Alison is involved in the Save Our Schools campaign, which is a parent-led campaign on school funding. So thank you very much, Alison. Hi, I must say I've got two tired, uh, two tired girls who've just started secondary school who you may hear in the background at some point, but here goes. Hello, and it's great to be joining you all today. Many thanks for inviting me. Um, as, uh, as you've just said, I'm a parent campaigner and co-founder of Save Our Schools UK. UK. We're a group that began in Brighton, spread to Birmingham, and from which groups then sprang up around the country. We started in 2017. A small group of fellow mums and I decided we'd had enough. We wanted to change the multiple ways in which government had been failing our education uh, system, damaging our state schools, failing our children through ill-conceived policies, a backwards-looking ideological agenda, and a catalogue of funding cuts. We've always worked closely with head teachers and teaching unions, knowing that policymakers and fellow parents listen to school leaders and knowing that we are stronger, as Jeff has just said, when we coordinate our efforts. Three and a half years on, and as we've heard many times tonight, so I'm, I'm going to cut all the detail. Um, I won't repeat that, but despite the hard won additional funding that we secured through our joint efforts, the nightmare continues. Head teachers are still losing sleep over budgets and school staff and pupils are still suffering because of lack of money. I'll just put in from a parent perspective uh, that uh, with no access to school premises, obviously PTAs are finding it difficult to fundraise. And then there's the impossibility of asking for donations from the many parents who have lost their jobs and those in insecure or ill-paid work who are struggling to put food on the table and pay bills. Meanwhile, the government operating on its awful deficit model for education in this crisis has put in its one billion for catch up and then the, the 250 million for the private tutoring. And this just feels like yet another initiative cooked up by people who have little understanding of how children learn best and of how the state education system works. Instead, it feels like something to get children through the statutory tests on which so much of our pol education policy is based and which government seems determined to cling on to in this year of all years. That money and more would be better offered to schools so that they can give our children the broad, balanced education we parents want our children to have. And instead, we see a government fixated with piling on the pressure with private tutoring, with children made to sit even more statutory tests than normal, including the extra phonics check for year twos this autumn, taking hundreds of hours away from valuable teaching time that could be used to bridge learning gaps. And all this pressure harms schools and children from deprived communities, 
who are already being hit hardest by the funding crisis, already be being hit hardest by COVID more than anyone else. As one head teacher we work with in Kent put it earlier this week, there has never been a level, play level playing field. Well, now there are children who don't even make it onto the pitch. And that brings us back to what lies at the center of it all, a generation of children and young people being abysmally failed by a government that simply can't adapt its ideology or its funding plans to COVID's new abnormal. It's a miracle that schools and head teachers are coping as well as they are, but a robust education system cannot run on miracles. It needs well thought out policy that puts children at its heart and is developed hand in hand with the profession. And of course, it needs proper funding. Proper funding and positive policy change will help schools reignite love of learning in our children. It will mitigate against the decline in the mental health of our young. It will offer them a future facing curriculum that sees beyond the pandemic to address key issues that so many of us care about, such as race, climate, equality. We'd like to see funding that does not buy into the deficit model of catch-up private tutoring, that does not waste resource on statutory testing, and that instead entrusts teachers and head teachers to do what they do best, helping all our children reach their potential. And that's why we at Save Our Schools support the call for additional COVID funding now for our children, for their future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alison. Thank you for making some really important and powerful points there. Um, and I can see from the chat that lots of people are appreciating our speakers tonight and the points that you're making. So apologies in advance that we've had to curtail the questions to our panellists. And we've still got three more panellists we're trying to squeeze in. It always was an ambitious schedule. So the last three speakers, apologies, but if I just asked you to be uh, succinct with the points that you'd like to make, that will be very much appreciated. And we'll next go to Steve Edmonds from the National Governance Association. Thank you very much, Steve. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Um, my name is Steve Edmonds. I'm Director of Advice and Guidance at the National Governance Association. Um, we're an organisation, as I'm sure you know, that represents thousands of governors and, and trustees up and down the country. Uh, these are people who spend countless hours uh, on a voluntary basis on, on behalf of children, young people uh, and their communities, uh, and also amongst their core functions. Uh, is overseeing the financial performance of the school or trust and making sure the money's well spent. So theirs is a really important voice uh, in this conversation. And our annual survey uh, of school governance, which uh, we undertook over the summer, uh, provides uh, a very strong and, and credible evidence base that supports uh, the analysis that we, we've heard throughout the evening. Um, you know, let's be let's be clear. The balance in the budget uh, remains the top concern for governing boards more than any other, uh, and that's the case for all types of of, of school uh, and governing structure, uh, and probably the most concerning aspect of uh, of this is that we're still seeing too much unwanted evidence year on year in our surveys of school governing boards having to compromise on their vision uh, for their pupils uh, in order uh, to ensure that the, the budget is balanced. Uh, and that is not a progressive uh, way of governing. And it's certainly not what I volunteer to do and, and what countless other, others volunteer to do to make those decisions that we feel we have no choice to make about making staff redundant, uh, reducing the spend on our education environment, or indeed uh, compromising on the curriculum. Um, so, you know, that, that really supports a lot of, of, of what has already been said. And, and our survey took place between May and May and July. And, and of course, that was in the midst of the pandemic, which is still going on. And, and these issues have been, you know, have been amplified uh, by the pandemic. And, uh, and, and as has child poverty, you know, the department's funding formula, which has already been mentioned, how that hurts disadvantaged kids the most. Um, and, and those issues which uh, around uh, expenditure 
on, on control measures and how that's going to be met in a sustainable way really challenge us. So as an organisation, we remain committed to working alongside you and, uh, and being part of that collective effort, calling on the government to deliver that long term plan for school spending that we know we need linked to those reforms in, in, in high needs uh, and with a clear focus on those areas that we've heard are under the most pressure early years uh, and, and 16 to 19 funding. So NGA is very much behind that. Um, and, and we're also committed to supporting our, our member governing boards, indeed all governing boards, uh, to do what they can in these very difficult circumstances to make the most effective use uh, of their resources and optimise those resources through uh, support for financial governance that, that shines a particular light, I think, on, on the really important role that school business leadership has to play in achieving that. So I hope that was a, a, you know, a, a, a coherent summary of where NGA is on this. Thank you very much, Stephen. And sorry for cutting you short somewhat, but I can see from the chat and I know from people who've registered, we've got an awful lot of governance, uh, governors present in the call. Uh, so thank you very much for speaking from a governor's perspective this evening. Uh, we're going to move on now to Jules White, um, but just to say thank you to Meg, who I know has been answering some of the questions that have been asked in the Q&A button. If any of the other panellists want to have a look in the Q&A and feel they can answer any questions, do feel, do feel free to write a written answer to those. Uh, but I'll now invite Jules White, who is a secondary school head teacher and is one of the founders of the Worthless Campaign. Thank you, Jules. Hello, everyone. Am I coming through, Laura? You are coming through, yes, Jules. Okay, hello, everyone. Um, nice to see you all. Uh, Luke Sibieta said to you, I can't give you any advice on what to do. Well, hopefully over the next three or four minutes, I'll try and do just that. I'll take you back four or five years. There I was, a hard pressed head teacher, always thinking that I was getting it wrong. It was a dark Friday evening and the accountability, the targets, the results, the keeping children safe just was feeling harder and harder. And of course, we were doing it with less and less resources. I turned on my local radio, good old BBC Radio Sussex. And um, I heard someone from the DfE at the tail end of an interview saying, um, schools have never had it so good. And uh, wait for the phrase, you've got more money than ever before. Uh, my thought uh, was bollocks. And I was so fed up. And I went home to my wife and I said, um, it's like we're worthless. And worthless was born. And it was born uh, with me and my brilliant PA, Gemma. And I wanted to do something about it. So this chat is about seeing if we can turn things around. We have amazing professional associations, the support from NHT, from Paul, from Jeff at our school, Kevin, and so on is wonderful. But I think as individuals, collectively, we can work together to do something really fantastic. So I rang up my local radio station. Uh, I didn't quite use the word bollocks, but I said that I'm prepared to take on the person from the DfE. And we went from there and some head teachers joined me in a letter writing campaign just across West Sussex. And then some head teachers from Essex heard about it and they wrote to me and they wanted to join in. And of course, we're all in the same boat. But what we've got to do, as Jeff and others have said, is that we've actually got to make a difference. And what I'd like to say to you now is please make sure you make your voice is heard. I spent a lot of time in my career being really frightened. Frightened about getting things wrong. Frightened about having Ofsted make the call. Frightened that I wasn't good enough. But actually, when you start speaking out, when you start campaigning, you really can make a difference. And I think along with many of the panelists here, we have got significant extra funding into schools. We have shown that we can get up the political agenda and we can have a genuine voice. And Worthless now covers 77 local authorities with heads from up and down the country, many of whom who are speaking out day in and day out. And what are the challenges? Well, the challenges are around funding, but they're around accountability, they're around assessment, they're around our awful provision for high needs and children from our most disadvantaged communities. So what can you do? Well, of course, work for your professional associations, but please take the time to speak out. Meg Hillier will tell you that if you fill up her inbox 
with lots of concerns, it will get action. And I can tell you that if some MPs get cross with you, it means that you're making a difference. They tend not to like it if you are persistent. The media are actually really reliable in 99% of cases. And if you speak to them, they will give you a fair go. And it's also quite exciting occasionally appearing in your local newspaper or on the telly. MPs are actually bothered and our biggest supporters are our parents. And if you speak out on their children's behalf, they will be with you. We have fantastic groups like the Educational Select Committee led by Robert Halfon, who are really, really bothered. Please, please, please make sure you campaign, look after our children, be relentlessly reasonable, if you can see that, and make sure that you join Worth Less and drop me a line if you're interested. Thanks ever so much. Thank you so much, Jules, for that really impassioned contribution uh, and for being relentlessly reasonable with uh, your, your speaking with us tonight. So thank you. Uh, now move on to Paul Whiteman. Uh, Paul, if you could be quite succinct for us now, because apologies, we are running over, uh, but we will wrap up as soon as possible. But it's been really great to hear from so, so many perspectives here tonight. So thank you, Paul. So give a trade union general secretary an audience and some time and tell him to be quick. Uh, and that's always a difficult challenge, but I, I, I do my very best. And it's just to really underline some of what Jules just said. And I'm so pleased we've been able to work alongside the Worthless campaign over the last couple of years because it shows uh, professional associations and trade unions working with the grassroots as well, because the government would have you believe that the trade unions come at this from some political philosophical point of view and what we have to say on behalf of our tens of thousands of members or hundreds of thousands if you include the teaching unions as well is somehow motivated by politics and political opposition when actually it's not it's motivated by the care for children and the care for schools NAHT is a politically independent union and I value that independence uh, independence and I guard it jealously because that allows me to speak on behalf of our members and praise uh, policymakers and governments where they get it right and to criticise them where they get it wrong without fear or favour. And this government is getting it very badly wrong. The, the political choice of austerity for the 10 years that preceded uh, uh, the last election and COVID was, was the choice of this government. Um, and it's the choice of this government to invest almost everywhere else but in schools right now in responding to the COVID pandemic. So. A few things that I'd just like to say and appeal to the government really and appeal to everybody that supports. Investing in schools is an investment in all of our futures, not just the future of the children in schools, but it's the, it's the country's future that we're investing in. It's not a, a, a drain on the exchequer. Um, and we, we know that. Um, we can see that schools are a frontline service. The pandemic has shown us that they're a frontline service in the middle of communities. I hear stories of school leaders and teachers helping with benefit applications because they're the only public service left in the community uh, doing education and everything else alongside it. So as we come into a post-Brexit world and a post-Covid world, it will be the children that are taking their exams if they take place in 2021 and children that are in school now that will either reap the benefits of Brexit or repair the damage. Um, and it will be those that, that uh, see us through the recovery of the pandemic as we see the cost and the, the huge costs of seeing the country through, through it over the next decade or so. So it's more important than we can imagine. And we're getting children ready for jobs and an economy that we can't even imagine at the moment. So a, a narrow focus on a very narrow curriculum and funding for a narrow curriculum is the wrong move uh, because it won't support us in what we need. And then in terms of the money coming through, the government likes to boast about its funding. It's boasting a lot about its £7.1 billion coming through, which is being eroded as before it even arrives with the, the increasing cost of wages and pensions. And that's talked about as if it was a cost to one side of education. Education is a people business. The biggest cost has to be on teachers and their teams and, and school leaders and their teams to make sure that we get it right. And the promise to fund everything else COVID related across other public services, but not schools, is a promise that hasn't been made and I can't understand why. And then when we do get money as described earlier on, it's hypothecated and therefore school leaders aren't getting, school and college leaders aren't getting the chance to put the money where it's needed. So just to reiterate, to finish uh, what we can do to, to, to kind of echo uh, what Jules said really, um, 
if we now understand and parents understand the importance of schools in our communities, now is the time to, to organise again in those communities to underline how important they are, as we did uh, leading up to the last election when some money came forward. Uh, do write to MPs, do take part in the campaign, but we need to make sure that it remains a grassroots issue, not a headline issue that comes out of the House of Commons at question time, but it's grassroots with MPs and talked about in committees. We need to make sure that that parental support um, that we heard so passionately early on remains there and that parental understanding uh, remains there as well. And, and although uh, George was talking about filling Meg's inbox up, I don't think he meant, me, meant Meg individually. I'm sure he meant all MPs. Uh, and actually what's really impressed me, uh, politics is still an honourable business, despite what you will see in the press quite often. I spend a lot of time with politicians and a lot of time with parliamentarians and they truly care and they're people trying to get it right, whatever side of the political divide they are. So talking to backbenchers is as important as talking to anybody else because that's where the influence comes from. So that, that's my appeal. Uh, if we can work together, we really can continue to make a difference. And, and thank you for taking me, uh, even though we've underrun so, so, so overrun so far, but it was wonderful to be able to take part and speak to everybody tonight. Thank you very much, Paul. It was never in doubt that we were going to uh, have your contribution here tonight. So thank you. Uh, Meg, I'm just going to come to you for a very, very brief, uh, just summing up some final comments, please, because we appreciate you staying with us for the duration of the webinar. Thank you, Meg. Well, can I thank you all? Because this is richness of information that is very helpful. Please don't fill up my personal inbox, because what, what, what you do need to do, I completely echo what Paul says. So MPs, we're sometimes, sometimes derided by Whitehall for being parochial. It's our job to listen to you at local level and then reflect that in the House of Commons. And nearly, you know, most MPs I know really do care about what's going on, but you need to use your voice, as we heard um, from Jules. And that's especially if you don't usually use your voice. So if you're, I mean, you know, I'm nothing against political activists because I'm one, but actually what really worked in 2017 was there was an army of people who hadn't got involved before. And you don't need to march. I was just reading through the chat to see what people were suggesting. You actually, what you, you can do, I mean, knowing COVID, that's more, more difficult. The really key thing is to get the right information, data, 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 factual stuff that people can raise, MPs can raise here with ministers. And honestly, in especially with COVID, we have seen, and other MPs on the call will, will know, lots of voices from all sides of the chamber saying the same thing from direct conversations they've had with people on the same issue in their constituency. So let's make sure that voice is being heard around school funding. You need to really just get that information in. And, you know, we've heard a lot about special education and these other things. I put com comments and, and stuff in the Q&A because so, I knew we wouldn't have time to answer these, but use your voice, coordinate, keep this broad coalition, but get those parents involved. And can I just make a plea? I put it in the comments, but can school governors and heads make sure that they do share their budget situation with parents? I have had too many occasions where I've been told by parents, well, I've asked for the information, they won't give it to me. And parent and heads and governors telling me they're frightened to give away that information. It's taxpayers' money that funds your school, whichever way it comes through, whichever you know, you get tax, it's taxpayers' fund money. As a parent, you're entitled to know. As a governor, you're entitled to know. Nothing should be hidden except possibly a tiny commercial element at the moment, but it's public information. That transparency will help you make the case. So really, thank you very much. Um, I'm constantly on this case. And I know, as I say, there's members of the Education Select Committee, Ian Mearns in particular, I know is on the call, who are listening to this too. So thank you for your input, but lobby your own MP. And I would say on lobbying, it's not volume, it's quality. So, you know, one well-written letter has more effect than 300 form letters, just to, just a serious point there. We're all overloaded too, and that will be a much better way of doing it. But you, the arguments you've made tonight, just make those to your own MP. Please, please do, and we'll get a voice a louder voice here in Parliament arguing your case for you here as well as what we're doing out there. Thank you very much. And thank you for all you're doing, leading our schools, supporting our pupils, and making sure that next generation is getting the best support they possibly can, even in these very difficult circumstances. Your heroes, all of you, thank you. Thank you very much, Meg, for all your contribution. And I'd say particularly for that last comment, I know it will be very welcomed by all the school leaders, governors and parents who are on uh, the call tonight. So thank you. Um, and that's that's it for all our speakers. Um, I appreciate everybody who stuck with us to the end. And I'm sorry that we have overrun and we've had to curtail the questions and the interaction. It was always an ambitious programme of speakers because we were trying to bring together so many different groups who were interested and wanting to contribute and be part of a school funding discussion and campaign. 
campaign. So thank you to each and every one of you who've spoken tonight and everyone who's attended. Um, it's really important that we do build a coalition and we work together. Uh, school leaders, teachers, support staff, all trade unions, parents, governors, um, and all, with politicians, all campaigning organisations. Um, everybody is uh, valuable, everybody's voice is valuable, but it's when we come together that we do have the strength to try and make change. So thank you very much for that. So just to answer some questions, this uh, webinar will be available to watch tomorrow. It will be hosted on the NEHT website and we will send an email to everyone who's registered uh, to attend this webinar uh, announcing it and we'll also put it on Twitter uh, and you're very welcome to watch it again. Uh, but thank Thank you very much for your time this evening it's very much appreciated and I think at the heart of what everyone said tonight has been focusing on the children and their education and I think it's the fact that children only get one chance at their education and um, if it's an underfunded education it's not the quality of education that they deserve and they don't get a chance at another one so if we keep that in mind and if we want to work forward uh, work together going forward then I know all members of the coalition and everyone who's spoken on this uh, broadcast tonight will be very grateful for everyone's participation participation in doing that thank you very much everybody for your time this evening and good night <laughs>